Jorge, I am so happy that you went with the honey jack this week because, oh, I'm not ready for rough stuff after that episode. Oh, hey, hi, it's me. Well, my finger do fully untucked for this week's episode of Untucked. So let's get to it. Well, you can certainly see we are getting down to the nitty gritty because less and less girls are safe each week. I'm so serious. The safe girls, Cracker and Cameron, were very surprised to find out that they were safe. But I don't know why. I mean, although they weren't the best on the Snatch Game panel, they certainly weren't the worst. I'm so serious. That dubious honor goes to Monique, Asia, and the victim. Which is what I'm calling her from now on. Seriously. Plus, Cracker was right. Those girls looked flawless. Thanks to money well spent on those gorgeous costumes. But I have to say, I was a little shocked to hear how much money they'd invested on this season of RuPaul's Drag Race. Don't anyone tell Monique? And in a side note, once again, if any queens out there want to throw those couture dollars my way, I hook you up. Not that it takes money to win, but it sure doesn't hurt. Speaking of money, I was so surprised to hear that Cameron owns a house. Seriously. Gorgeous in drag, handsome out of drag, and equity? Hmm. Slowly, the mystery as to why I'm still single reveals itself. Ugh. Personally, I have to say I really enjoyed listening to those girls discuss who they thought won Snatch Game because they have no agenda. There's nobody in particular that they're rooting for or not rooting for. I thought that it was great that they pointed out that Monique is pulling all these looks together the day of the challenge. They seemed severely impressed. Plus, they thought Eureka slayed and that it was down to Monet and Eureka to be named the winners. I have to say I was a little surprised that neither of them mentioned Aquaria, but maybe that's because most of what Aquaria did was so quick and subtle. In a side note, quick and subtle was the name of my one-woman show, just saying. But before they could get too into it, the rest of the girls were wheeled into the untucked lounge and right away, Cracker complained that she and Cameron walked while the rest of the girls got chauffeured. But then again, she didn't realize the fish fry that was going on on that main stage. I'm so serious. Right away, Cracker asked Eureka how much the judges loved her. And although Eureka admitted that they liked her honey boo boo, her subtle tone told another story. And that story was about a bear. Seriously. I thought it was very smart of Eureka not to mention the victim by name. Instead, she said some people had a problem with her performance. Personally, I think she just had enough of getting yelled at. I know, I was getting tired of it. Thank goodness Monet was there to spill the tea. She told Cameron and Cracker that Rue had asked them who they thought should go home. And in Monet fashion, she said, everyone said Cameron. Well, oh, poor Cameron. I hope she cleans out that costume before she packs it, because I think she pooped that fishtail just a little bit. I'm so serious. After Monet calmed Cameron down, it was revealed that all the queens except Eureka had picked the vixen to go home. And that's when her dial got turned up to 10. The victim couldn't believe that they had picked her, especially after every one of those girls allegedly saying that Eureka had got on their nerves. I have to say, I was very impressed with Cameron and Monet because they both said they never said such a thing. There was a third girl I could hear that said that too, but I couldn't see who it was. I'm gonna say it was Aquaria. I don't know why. But seriously, even Monet went so far as to say, tell me what I said, tell me what I said. And that's when that dial got twisted right off the bear, seriously. And here's why I'm calling the victim the victim. She is far too caught up in uh, this supposed friendship alliance that goes unspoken in the workroom. That if we're friendly, then we're not ever going to vote each other out. It's a competition, victim. Pull it together. You should be more worried about touching up those shake and go wigs and fixing your armpit tits is all I'm saying. Plus the fact that the victim expects everyone to accept her over the top angry way while dismissing Eureka's over the top 
friendly way. It's really a sad reflection on the victim's character, I'm so serious. How can she go through life being so volatile and explosive and expect people to accept her when she's not extending that same courtesy to anyone else? I'm so serious. I'll tell you what, Eureka and the victim may suck the air out of the room they're in, but I'll tell you, I'll pick a room with Eureka over a room with the victim any day of the week, sucking or not. Personally, I was glad that Eureka finally started standing up for herself. I mean, seriously, they were down the rabbit hole at this point anyway. Why hold back anymore? She said she was not disrespectful with her job, and I have to agree with her. She is not. What was disrespectful was the victim calling all the other girls disloyal for picking her in the first place, which of course went over like a lead fist in the face. Seriously. This is why the victim scurried off like a scared little guppy. Of course she can't accept that she's difficult, hard to work with, or disrespectful to the other girls. How could she? In the theater of her mind, she's the one who's always right. I mean, if this is how she's going through life all the time, something tells me there's a small group of queens in Chicago right now agreeing with me. I'm just saying. Here's to you girls. Even Monet called the victim immature for her quick exit, but I have to say I'm not surprised by it. It's the true sign of a bully. They'd rather run away than lose a fight. I'm just saying. Thank goodness Monique pointed out to the other girls that a good Judy would have said simply and clearly, sis, you didn't do it. Hashtag try harder next time is all I'm saying. That's when the victim came waddling back into the untucked lounge mostly because she'd had a few minutes to think of more things to say. And one of those things was to attack Monique for not being prepared for the competition, which of course was a lie. Monique may not have had a lot of drag with her, but that doesn't mean she wasn't prepared to compete. I'm so serious. And the minute that that argument didn't fly, the victim shut everyone down by telling them all not to come near her ever again. <laughs> Done. Next week's episode's gonna be a hoot, eh? But before the victim could come up with anything more to say, they wheeled in a TV for a message from home. Now, normally I would have said, thank the baby Jesus for the distraction. But I have to say, the minute I found out it was a message for the victim, I didn't care. No offense to anyone. I mean, seriously, if anyone needed a loving message from home this week, it certainly was the victim, I'm so serious. I have to say, even the victim's tears couldn't change my opinion of her after all of her screaming and vitriol, I'm just saying. But I am glad that the rest of the cast could put aside her shenanigans and show her some love and support after her mother's message was done. Seriously, I know I'm not a big enough person to do that. And I'm a moose. I will say this, I'm glad that after her mama's message, the victim was able to say the, to the girls that she wasn't angry, she was hurt, which I totally understand. But seriously, just as she had me on the precipice of forgiveness, that's when she lost me again by saying that the rest of the girls didn't understand that being on RuPaul's Drag Race was her dream. What did she think it was for the other girls? An afterthought? What, were they all standing in the alley sharing a cigarette? And they said, we need three more girls. Come on in. Seriously. This is the root of the victim's problems, in my opinion. In the theater of her mind, she's the only one with dreams and aspirations. And the rest of the girls are just wasting space. Seriously. And while all that mess was going on, there was poor sweet Monique Hart silently stewing over the fact that she knew if she was in the bottom two, she would be going home because she hadn't learned the words to the lip sync. How is that possible? She blamed the fact that she was busy sewing and making outfits, but the last time I sat at a sewing machine, I didn't use my ears to make a dress. I'm just saying, stop being a victim, Monique. That role's already been cast. And as she predicted, Monique was the girl to sashay home this week. And I, for one, am very sad to see her go. I suspect that that workroom is going to be a little less fabulous with her gone. 
I'm just saying. So, there's only seven girls left, and I can hear everyone screaming right now for the victim to be the next one to go. And if she's in the bottom two again, she may very well sashay because I don't think any girl other than Raven has ever survived being in the bottom that many times. I'm just saying. So the only thing we'll have to do is tune in to RuPaul's Drag Race next week. And don't forget, you can also tune into my YouTube channel for my live commercial breaks from Wayla Bar and Lounge here in Toronto, 996 Queen Street East. Then, after you've watched the episode, do come on back and see me at the Finger Do Review so you and I can compare notes. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you haven't. And don't forget to like it and share it. And finally, miss me! Mwah! Seriously, Jorge, I, I, I gotta change my mask. This thing keeps flaking off into my teeth.